Hi, welcome to the Fit and Healthy Today show. Today we're talking about a subject that's near and dear to my heart and probably to about 50% of Americans that are age 40 and over. Acid reflux as well as the hiatal hernia. What are these? Okay, what happens is, is when you get food matter that's sitting in here in an undigested form, you know, the body excretes stomach acids and things to break down the food. Well, what happens is, is if you don't have good digestion and some of these other causes we'll talk about, uh, the food and the acid splash up into the esophagus and actually literally you can get what feels like burning in the back of the throat and it causes heartburn, chest pains, belching. I've, literally there have been people that have gone to the hospital that say I think I'm having a heart attack when they're having acid reflux because it gives that similar type of a chest pain. Uh, uh, hiatal hernia, hmm, like I said, 50% of Americans over the age of 40 suffer to some extent of a hiatal hernia. Literally, as I mentioned on here, part of the stomach protrudes through the opening of the diaphragm and into the chest cavity. And we have these little rings around our, um, that allow food to go into our stomach. And when we're eating, uh, they open. And they say, okay, we're going to let this food come in here. And when we're all done eating, there's a message sent to the brain to constrict these muscular rings and hold the food inside the stomach. And then it churns and does whatever else it has to do, pro enzymes and all of that. Um, and it's not supposed to be coming back up through these rings. But problem lies that if we have a poor diet, junk food, uh, oh my gosh, uh, especially things like burgers and fries and foods that actually can take a long time to digest that are not enzyme rich, and the lack of enzyme rich foods. This food kind of just sits in there and it rots and then the body kind of tries, relaxes these muscular rings and the food comes back up again. Or over a period of time from the food sitting in the stomach so long, it can kind of eat away these areas. In addition, if we got the big old gut in front of us, guess what? It pushes it up, you know? Or if we overeat, it pushes it up. So. Uh, we'll talk about ways that we can reduce that, but obviously if you've got the poor diet, you've got that extra weight going on there, and then there are genetic tendencies. Some of us, um, like my mother has a hiatal hernia, and I have tendencies, and when I was pregnant, oh my gosh, whoa, uh, it was burning all the time, and I could feel it, and so I kind of know, I, I do enzymes and some other things we'll talk about so that I don't have those issues anymore uh, without taking the drugs, which uh, lend themselves to their own side effects. Gallbladder malfunctioning or gallbladder stones. When we don't get adequate amounts of bile excretion to help digest proteins and fats, the food sits there and there and rots as well and can come back up. The key is we want enzymes enzymes, proper pancreatic enzymes, proper digestive enzymes, proper um, stomach acid secretions for the foods that we're eating in order to break the food down so it evacuates out of the stomach and goes to the small intestines. Like I said, if it sits there and kind of rots away, boom, it can come back up again. Stress, um, when you're stressed out, basically when you have stress, your body spares its enzymes for you dealing with that fight or flight. So good luck. When you're under a lot of stress for a lengthy period of time, you're not going to have enzymes to break your food down and it's just going to sit there and rot and come back up again. Traumas to the stomach area, I know, especially among young boys, including my own sons, they like to hit each other all the time and stomach area and that type of thing, which can literally contribute or cause those little hernias uh, to develop and have that protruding in the chest cavity. Inflammatory issues or food allergies can also cause the area, these rings to become inflamed and protrude as well. When we're talking about diet and the best things to eat in order to lessen the symptoms of acid reflux, uh, there is a theory, uh, eat right for your blood type is what the book is called. And I found it to be probably about 70 to 80% uh, accurate not for everybody, but we tend to notice among certain blood types that like O blood types tend to be able to digest proteins and meats and those types of things. But you throw a steak on my A blood type stomach, it sits there. I have to take additional amounts of enzymes to help break it down. My body apparently just wasn't geared genetically to break down those types of meats. So you need to be observant of the type of foods that you have a difficult time digesting and you avoid them or you take additional amounts of enzymes or supplementation to help you break those foods down. 
The best diet for people who have acid reflux are to look for foods that are enzyme rich, unrefined uh, types of foods. So you're talking about your fruits and your vegetables, your whole grains, your nuts, your nuts which are also very anti-inflammatory. Um, drinking two glasses of water every two waking hours. Now, when you drink water, obviously it can dilute some of these stomach acids that you may be putting out because of stress or whatever reason. And so you can help just by drinking those couple glasses of water alone to keep that from coming back up again as well. Cabbage juice. I've looked high and low for cabbage juice and it's very, very hard to find. So unless you have a juicer, it's hard, difficult um, to find it or locate it. But cabbage juice been around for centuries centuries use, and they, uh, old sauerkraut is actually what they used to use in, in Europe, to heal stomach ulcers and to uh, get that reflux, calm that down a bit. Avoid overeating, we talked about that already, because you fill that stomach up, mm, I guess it's going to overflow, and where is it going to go? It's going to go back up again as the stomach is churning. Avoid hard to digest foods, as we mentioned before. Keep track of the things that you know you have a problem with. And caffeine, alcohol, chocolate, and spicy foods, oh mama, you're going to have a problem with those if you have acid reflux or a hiatal hernia because they're, they're pretty acidic and irritating to the stomach and so, and that burn on the way back up. So if you have a problem with those, don't do them. We are going to move on to supplements that I know from a personal standpoint as well as what my customers use all researched with double blind placebo studies every single one of them uh, some of which I'll, I'll mention the studies are on the most effective thing that I've seen double blind placebo studies to help heal esophageal lessen that burning diglyceride licorice I abbreviated it called DGL four or five hundred milligrams three times a day uh, empty stomach 20 minutes before meals was e as effective as tagment and that's a stomach acid uh, suppressor for healing ulcers but in addition the diglyceride licorice helps heal the linings the mucosal linings in the uh, and the layers in the stomach and the esophageal whoa it also is utilized actually for inflammatory bladder issues too because these are all expandable very high epithelial cells um, uh, collagen type cells and that is very healing on those types of cells like glyceride licorice enzymes if there's certain foods that you have a problem digesting or you're under a lot of stress or you have no gallbladder despite what a lot of doctors say enzymes do help break your food down um, they digest the foods for me. If I eat beef, I'm going to take something called super enzymes. It has a little bit of extra betaine hydrochloride, stomach acids, and some um, pancreatic enzymes to help break down that meat that I don't seem to digest very well. Most acid reflux that I see people come in with are n is not, they're not because of acids. I mean, people know from the time they're small kids on upward if they've got true stomach acid problems. If they don't, Obviously, then we got to look at other issues such as enzymes, if they don't have a gallbladder, and all those other things that I discussed earlier, and try to alleviate those first instead of throwing people on drugs. Now, these drugs, they come with side effects, especially if you're a menopausal woman or you're a frail bone person. They found that these protonics, if taken at least for, um, I think the studies were uh, three years. 44% increase in hip fractures. So, boy oh boy, if you got a bone density problem, you do not, absolutely do not do those acid um, reducers or any of the types of those drugs because it blocks the calcium, magnesium, and mineral absorption. It also causes blood pressure issues. I mean, the list goes on. Research it for yourself. But I gotta tell you, try everything else. Those are only last resort, okay? Aloe vera juice. Aloe, once again, been around for centuries. Uh, a lot of empirical data on that one. Promotes healing and soothes digestion and it can also help with constipation as well. But very soothing. I, I have a 23-year-old son that gets a lot of these kind of issues. And the aloe, he'll, he'll do an aloe brand called, it's George's, but because it, it doesn't have much taste. But he'll sit there and do that and it just soothes that stomach, stops that burning down. 
Next, Vomica, particularly, uh, that's a homeopathic remedy that you um, let absorb and soak under the tongue. Next, Vomica is very effective for stress-induced acid reflux. And you take three or four of those 30 C tabs under the tongue, and boy, I'll tell you, it works, it works, it works. So I always ask some questions. Um, uh, my customers usually come in with an idea of what they want, but I'll ask a few questions to kind of steer them in the right direction. And Nux Vomica, a uh, lot of good studies on that and very helpful for stress-induced. Slippery Elm. Now I'm a singer and I sing and we've used Slippery Elm for a lot of years in order to, when we over sing or we sing a lot, the Slippery Elm will really, really help soothe our um, <coughs> vocal cords, those very expandable tissues. Well, Slippery Elm also helps the expandable tissues in the esophageal and the stomach. So chewable or in a tincture form, you can get it, um, it's an herbal tincture you can put in water or take it out right, uh, will help heal that. Marshmallow root, been around for long, once again, centuries again. Tea or three milliliters, which would probably be about a half a teaspoon of the tinker. Susan reduces inflammation of the esophageal and stomach area as well because we can get burning, aloe helps, we can heal the lining, but sometimes we get inflammation as well and it can be helpful. Probiotics. Huh. Those are the good bacteria that the body uses to um, help fight off infections, help with, oh my God, serotonin levels, everything. But they help fight off what is called H. pylori bacteria. And, and H. pylori is a type of bacteria that eats away the stomach lining. So if you have a propensity towards that and have ulcers, probiotics, uh, four billion at least per day on an empty stomach, can help keep those good bacteria up so the bad bacteria Bacteria don't flourish. Super green drinks, neutralizing acidity. Okay, when we're talking about diet, and we've talked about the diet so much, alkaline your diet and keeping it in a non acidic um, fashion helps so much with stomach issues, helps with energy, helps with the list goes on and on. But if you alkali, and I know some of these super green types of drinks can alkali the blood, they give you energy, but they also can reduce that acid reflux. Liquid calcium magnesium. Now mind you now, if you're doing tagamine or the acid uh, protonics, um, you're not going to absorb this. But your body, in order to be able to properly constrict and relax these, um, this little muscle ring here, and including the rest of your vascular system and your other muscles in your body, it requires calcium magnesium. And so what the suggestion is, is probably about a thousand milligrams, uh, 500 milligram ratio, um, divided dosages twice a day. It relaxes those, uh, that little um, muscle and so that it can properly ah, just let the food stay inside of there and it doesn't tighten and constrict. There are, as we mentioned before, emotional uh, triggers for acid reflux and there is a, a branch of, I would call it medicine out there, uh, called flower essence medicines, Bach flower essences, and there are other brands as well too. Bach's just been around for I think 60, 70 years, long time, longer than most medications. And there's certain, um, you can look it up online, or there's certain symptoms that accompany certain things that can release or reduce emotional triggers, and the Bach flower essences can be very helpful for that. Um, Chiropractic, osteopath, or naturopathic doctors are taught. Now, usually within two or three uh, treatments, and I usually tell people to go see, you know, one of our local, we've got a lot of good local um, chiropractors. I know my son goes to Dr. Gene Pritchett, and what happens is, is they can press down here and get that hernia to kind of go back in again, and they can teach you how to do it. And considering 50% of people over age 40 have some degrees of a hyaluronic hernia, we get that pushed back in so that the muscles can uh, constrict and, and close properly, or constrict and, and expand properly. Um, very gentle, very mild, and painful to do so, and like I said, within a few treatments. There are other things to consider when you have acid reflux. Oh, if you lay flat in your bed and you have acid reflux, I know when I was pregnant, burn, 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 burn. 
you got to sit in a little bit of an, or, or not sit, but lay down with a little bit of an incline. A couple of pillows behind you to raise you up a little bit, or if you've got one of those expensive beds uh, that can tilt you up a little bit, that can keep that, that flow from happening when you lay down. Smoking really, really stimulates acid reflux, and the nicotine combinations just cause that to get really, really acidic. In addition, smoking causes the body to become acidic as well. Lose weight if you're obese. And I know everybody says, Heike, that's easier said than done. But if this is a problem that bothers you a lot, you'll lose the weight. Because seriously, this stomach acids, if you do have this issue and you do nothing about it, which absolutely the doctors are right, you should do something about it, you need to drop the weight. Otherwise, you can develop esophageal or stomach cancers because this does burn away these linings and if you don't have good nutrition these linings don't repair themselves and the cells will mutate and become precancer or cancerous so you have to address this issue I'm of the opinion not with medications but and there are other means you should always try first as I discussed earlier I think when you're evaluating and you know you go to, when you go into your healthcare professional and you start to talk about this acid reflux issue, um, a lot of questions should be asked. There's certain testings, hormonal testings, enzyme testings, liver function testings, pancreatic. I think those are all issues that you should discuss with your doctor as well uh, in order to get the testing that could diagnose maybe a potential issue. There are scoping procedures when the, where they can check and see what kind of damage has occurred. Um, once again, don't ignore this issue. It can turn into something bigger. Anyway, next we're going to be moving on. I'm going to show you a, a couple of uh, reflexology exercises and a, a couple of pressure, uh, a pressure point that can help you with this acid reflux. Thank you. Welcome to the fitness portion of our show and I'm going to show you a couple of exercises or I should say massages that can help you with uh, your hiatal hernia and with acid reflux. First, there's a pressure point right here. You know, you feel your rib cage and I don't know if you've ever had CPR, you feel that little break right there. Well, your stomach is right down below that cavity and when you're experiencing like that burning or you know the food's coming back up or even after a meal, if I know, particularly if I've eaten a high acid meal, this, I can't remember, but either I had a oriental medicine doctor show me this or a chiropractor, and it's been years ago, and sometimes you forget things and then you remember them again. You push, make a fist, push downward, trying to get that hernia back in again and close that valve in a downward fashion. And I know it, that exercise has helped me when I remember to do it. Uh, quite often. Now there's also a type of medicine called reflexology and our nice studio guys are going to put the uh, the graphic on because I want you to have an idea. There's different points on the foot that you can massage or hold that can help stimulate uh, or help areas where you're having a problem. And I have my handy dandy foot out here and if we look on there, we've got an area right in the center of our foot, a little bit below the bone, where we can hold and kind of massage, or you can get your honey to hold and massage it for you, which is even better, and just kind of hold it, massage that area, and your pancreas is just a little bit lower, you know, pancreatic enzymes, kind of just hold it, massage it really, really well, and see if maybe that doesn't help uh, with your digestion and alleviate some of your symptoms. Next, we're going to be moving on to the research portion of our show. Thank you. Hi, welcome to the research portion of our show. And with us today is Ralph Turciano. Ralph? And thank you for that intro. Well, speaking of H. pylori, in stomach ulcers. Well, an interesting study came out of the Massachusetts Institute of Technology along with Beth Israel Medical Center in regards to a unique amino acid and its effect on that nasty bug called H. pylori. The amino acid? Glutamine. 
What they discovered about H. pylori, or kind of new for a while, was this. H. pylori erodes the mucus lining cells of the stomach, intestinal tract, and so on and so forth, by the production of ammonia. By doing this, it damages the cells on a whole wide level. Well, here comes glutamine. Glutamine had one unique effect, which they discovered was pretty phenomenal. Glutamine literally detoxified the ammonia. And not only that, they said, quote unquote, our work demonstrated that the damaging effects of ammonia on gastric cells could be reversed completely by the administration of L-glutamine, the doctor said. The amino acid stimulated ammonia detoxification in the stomach as it does in the liver. So that effective concentration of ammonia was reduced, thereby blocking cell damage. Those of you with ulcers, those with maybe even some liver conditions where you build up a little bit of ammonia, really look at L-glutamine. Safe, effective, real easy to find. Pretty good stuff outside of everything out there. Now we go to the bird flu. Well, you know, we'd like to jump from flu to flu and virus to virus so like it's some sort of new movie or movie star going out there. We all want to vaccinate against it or do whatever we can. But we discovered one interesting thing about the bird flu, specifically, specifically H1N1. And this came out of the Imperial College and the University of North Carolina. The bird flu cannot survive in the nose. Why is that important? because the nose is usually the first place for infection where the virus can begin to grow. Why? Simple. The, stump, the temperature of the stomach where the birds usually catch the flu is about 40 degrees Celsius. The temperature in the nose of a regular human is 32 degrees Celsius. Bottom line is the nose where it needs to grow, it can't. It's too cold. So, good news for those which are a little bit paranoid about that bird flu. Unless you've got a really hot nose, it's not going anywhere. And those for us which are on, I should say, those people that are doing chemo. Good news in regard to nausea, something which has been confirmed that we've known for quite some time. And this came out of the University of Rochester Medical Center. It's about ginger. Something simple you could find just about any place also. Why is it important? Because those people who are going through chemotherapy frequently talk about nausea. Well, this little substance, ginger, at about a dosage of about one and a half grams, given three days prior and three days after, reduced the incidence of nausea in those chemo patients by 40%. Simple, safe, effective. Definitely worth a trip to get if you know anybody doing any sort of medical treatments. Of course, check with your doctor ahead of time. Uh, we're not aware of it interfering with any chemo drugs, but still, play it safe and ask. Now we go for the next big star of viruses and flus which are out there for quite some time. This is kind of interesting. This goes back to SARS. Remember SARS that were out there? Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome? Well, an interesting discovery. This one comes from algae. The word from this is called Griffithsin, otherwise GRFT for short. What they discovered through the American Thoracic Society, and they announced this at the 105th conference in San Diego, or I should say will be announced on May 29th, is a protein or lectin from algae called Griffithsin had this effect on SARS when mice were affected. It had a, the mice that got the algae that had SARS had a 100% survival rate exposure from to the SARS itself. So when exposed, 100% of the mice that got the algae pectin, lectin I should say, survived, compared to only 30% of those that did not get that algae lectin, called griffesin. What they also discovered was this, that a lot of the side effects, the weight loss, the necrosis of the lung tissue from the bronchitis and everything else that occurred did not happen in those mice which were given this algae lectin. Very simple, incredible stuff out there. So SARS comes back in the news, real simple stuff. What they also discovered this is this is how it worked. The antiviral effects happened by altering the shape of the sugar molecules that line the virus envelope, preventing it from basically replicating itself. Simple, neat, one major virus, 
Don't have to worry about it anymore. Actually, not two. I apologize. Now, genetics. 18th century, there was a guy by the name of Jean-Baptiste Lamarck. Now, I don't want to get too much into basically science in regards to this, but this guy predated Darwin. But he got shut down. Why? Because he believed you transfer genetics through cells, not just DNA. So he got thrown out of your classes. He was not taught anymore, basically shunned. And what discovery was this? That's not true. You do transfer your traits down from generation to generation through cells and DNA also. In fact, how much so? Let's give them an example. When working with flies, they found out when they expose fruit flies to certain chemicals that the damaging effects of that chemical exposure just once had effects for 13 generations afterwards. Outside of that, they found out when they gave mice a chemical that affected the pregnancy of rats, it went on for generations upon generations upon generations. So, something to think about when considering your health and chemical exposure. It's just not your children, but it's your children's 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 indefinitely. You begin to change your entire lineage by what you do now. Something to think about. Also, outside of that, we look from the Department of Family Medicine, Medical University of South, Carol of, uh, South Carolina. They compared our population to the population it was about three years ago. And this is the data they came up with in regards to our health. We are getting sicker. Why? Let's give you a couple ideas. Well, they looked at adults between the age of 40 to 74 years of age. They found out that our body masses had increased from 28% to 36%, meaning we're getting fatter. After that, our physical activity went from 12 times a month to much less. So most people aren't even active 12 times a month. In fact, the only people that are active 12 times a month, only 43% of our population, I should say. Smoking rates have not changed at all. All this anti-smoking campaign, these taxes, every attempt for every sick politician out there to do social engineering had zero impact out of all these years. Eating your fruits and vegetables. Well, back in the 1980, between 1994, where you see five or more fruits and vegetables, 42% of us did. Now, less than 26% of us get five servings of fruits and vegetables any longer. Alcohol use, up there. From 40 to 51% of our population is now doing moderate alcohol use on a daily basis. And the number of people adhering to all five healthy traits, simple traits, it went down from 15% in 1994 to only 8% in the year 2006. Outside of that, let me finish up with came out the American Thoracic Society in San Diego in regards to the flu vaccine. It was basically an article started out in regards to generally asthma. What they discovered was this, asthmatic kids and non-asthmatic kids. Those that got the flu vaccine were three times more likely to be hospitalized than those that did not. The Centers for Disease Control really has to relook at their policies and forcing these things upon these kids if there's no good science behind it. Well, thank you very much. That's the report. Thank you very much, Ralph. We really appreciate your information. Once again, we hope you research further. Pay attention to your health. Thank you for joining our show.